Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 243. Now we talk a lot about nutrition and diet and training and all that kind of stuff. And it's good to speak to people that have brought this all together in a deeply physical challenge that sets out to challenge them physically, mentally, change the status quo. Uh, and the man on the show today has done this in an incredible portion. I don't think I've ever seen an individual or heard of an individual that have ran quite so much. As you know, I'm not a runner, I'm a rugby player. I lift some weights, I chase after an egg. I, it doesn't involve running more than like five miles flat out. So to hear that someone ran 401 marathons back to back and went through 23 pairs of trainers is, well, OMG. Um, ben Smith, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben. Um, ben, I've just told everyone you did 401 marathons. That's like your headline piece. But okay. there's, I'm assuming there's a little bit more to you than the fact that you've done loads of running. So who's Ben Smith? Um, it's a... Funnily enough, I've never been asked that question. Who's Ben Smith? Um, <laughs> how do I answer this? I suppose I'm 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 a guy that that likes to dream big, and uh, I tend to just go for what I want. Really, um, I'm very different to how I was four years ago. Uh, I was uh, quite overweight. I was a smoker and a drinker, and for me, I found running, um, and it saved my life. Really, it gave me the ability to express myself. It gave me the ability to, you know, seek adventure and meet some amazing people. And it's kind of brought me to where I am, am today, obviously having completed the 401 marathons that you mentioned before. Okay, so before you said, I'm going to run 401 marathons, what, what were you doing? Were you a fitness guy or were you just working a normal job or what was the crack? Yeah, so I, I wasn't a fitness guy, let's just put it that way. Um, as I said, four years ago, I was quite overweight. I was 16 and a half stone. Uh, a smoker and a drinker, and I suffered a um, a TIA, which is an incompleted stroke. Um, I was at work, I was working 60, 70 hours a week in a corporate job, um, a job that I enjoyed, uh, and I loved the people that I worked with, but I, I'd always felt like I'd had to follow this kind of path in life, and, and I, I'd lost who I truly was. I didn't know who I truly was. Um, for me, you know, we grow up, and it's Success is deemed that you should be driving the right car, have the nice house, you know, the, the good wage packet. A lot of this stuff is quite materialistic, and I had all of that. But what I didn't have was the happiness inside of me. And when I had this TIA, it made me kind of sit up and take stock of my life. You know, I knew I had to change something. Uh, I didn't know what that was going to be. I didn't run at the time. And uh, I, I actually, in fact, hated running. <laughs> Um, but a mate of mine dragged me down to a local running club in Bristol where I live and it, it kind of transformed my life I, I fell in love I can't, I can't pinpoint the moment that it happened but my confidence and my self esteem started to come out I started to explore the world through running and about two years before the project started my confidence and self esteem was quite high and I had quite a lot of belief in myself. I've been training with a personal trainer here in Portishead uh, near Bristol. And I kind of thought, well, I want to do something more. I want to, you know, I want to incorporate running. I want to raise some money for charity. And I want them to be the charities that, that were quite personal to me. And over the next kind of two years, I came to the idea of running 401 marathons. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, amazing story. I, I only laughed at the end there. I didn't laugh at the story, so I just want to clarify that. Um, so, why four hundred and one? Like, not why didn't you go? Do you know what? I'll do ten. No. Well, I, I yeah, I I, I I do get this question asked quite a bit, and you know, I didn't just go from naught to four hundred and one. <laughs> um, you know, the process was quite organic, and and I think that's what I really liked about it, and why it felt right. Um, I, I ran 30 marathons in, in two years uh, leading up to this challenge and in a way it was a bit like training for this, if you can train for this at all, you know, it's one thing I found, you cannot train for something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 
I, we had a set of objectives in our challenge. We wanted to raise a quarter of a million pounds. Now, at the time, I didn't, I didn't have a profile. I was kind of a, a nobody. I, I didn't exist on, on that format. And to raise a quarter of a million pounds, you know, I've got some amazingly generous friends and family, but they ain't going to get me 250,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I knew I needed to do something of a large scale that was going to draw the necessary amount of attention to be able to allow us to raise a quarter of a million pounds. Mm -hmm. One of the other objectives as well was that we wanted to inspire people and challenge them to do things that they never thought they could do. So a bit like my history of running, I was never a runner. I was never a fitness guy. You know, if you'd have told me that I'd be where I am now four years ago, I probably would have laughed in your face and damned my pint of cider. So I wanted to kind of give back something that I got out of running. I also wanted to raise awareness for the issues of bullying. Now, this was kind of one of the major aspects that kind of led me to lead the life that I had before, you know, leading the life that I thought I should lead. I was bullied for eight years at school and it affected my confidence and self-esteem so badly that I tried to take my life when I was 18 and then again at 21. And I didn't have any belief in myself. I didn't have any kind of vision or objective. So running for me had given me that back. And then I wanted to kind of raise awareness around the subject naturally we needed to do something big so I kind of thought well I love marathon running these are my objectives I need to do something big the next logical step was let's have a look at what the world record was so we, we contacted Guinness and Guinness said that the world record stood at 52 it was actually a Japanese guy that had run 106 times around a running track for 52 days and kind of on the face of it I thought well that, that's great and I thought, well, mm, I'm not going to be able to do that because, you know, it's going to be quite boring. Mm. Mentally, it's going to take a lot out of me. And, and also, it doesn't really fit with what it is that we're trying to achieve in this challenge. You know, the inspiring people, the raising awareness, which would suggest that you get out to as many different places in the country, get as many people joining in as possible. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I'd have stuck to the kind of criteria that Guinness wanted. So... We made the decision quite early on that we wouldn't go for the world record. And I did a little bit more research, and it actually transpired that there were other people in the world that had, in a way, had the same vision as me, had the same kind of idea, wanted to do a large-scale challenge, but didn't necessarily want to do it from a record point of view. So there was an Australian couple that had done 100. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a couple of Americans that had done in the 200s. And... At the time of planning this, we the, the kind of the highest we could find was three six five by a Spanish guy. Um, there are other reports that there was another, you know, a monk that has done a thousand, um, and there's another report of another guy that's done six hundred and seven. But we couldn't kind of corroborate them. So I thought, well, three six five, all right, that's a year. Um, I thought, well, you know, if we're going to do it, let's let's go one better. But I didn't think 366 sounded that great, so I literally rounded it up. I rounded it up to 400. You know, I like my numbers. I like the kind of, you know, completeness of that. And then in April of 2015, so just before the project started in September, I went to the States to see whether I could run back to backs. And I did seven across seven days across seven counties from St. Louis down to New Orleans. And I got to run with this amazing guy called Larry Macon. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it was actually him that turned around to me and said, well, why don't you have a victory lap? You know, why don't you have an, an opportunity where you can bring people together mm -hmm. to celebrate what it is that you've achieved? And I kind of thought, well, if you look at our objectives, and you look at what we're trying to do this for, it makes perfect sense to do that. And that's what the 5th of October 2016 <laughs> last year was. Um, that was our victory lap, and that's kind of how the 401 came about. Very organic, very kind of truthful, and very much designed around the objectives that we wanted to get from it. That's awesome. Um, before we talk about any aspects of the challenge, I want to pick up on uh, probably a key point in that you said running saved your life. Mm. Now, it's obviously, I'm going to assume it's obviously not running that per se saved your life, but... It, it seemed like there was uh, kind of a ob slightly obsessive mentality or, or character trait that you've got and that you said you had a corporate job, you were working 60, 70 hours a week. It sounded like 
you were kind of quite attached to your job. When you weren't at the job, you were kind of maybe in the pub socialising and then it was back to work, um, you know, after a good night's sleep. Was it that running almost just gave you a focus that was then healthy and then led to more positive lifestyle changes? I, I think to a degree you're right. Um, but when I talk about how running saved my life, um, the best way to kind of explain this would be to go back to my experiences as being a child. You know, I, I was part of a military family. Um, we traveled all over the world. You know, I had an amazing kind of childhood up until the age of 10. And then I was part of a loving family. Um, my parents were based out in Germany and I ended up having to come to school in the UK. So I went away to school and I wasn't prepared for that. You know, going from a loving family into an environment which was very cold and very unpastoral, you know, I felt like my whole foundations had been ripped out away from me. And at the age of 10, you know, that that's quite a prime age. You know, we're starting to figure out, you know, who we are, you know, we, we're, we're almost about to get into puberty and, you know, things are changing and we want our support networks around us. And I just felt like I didn't have that. So it made me an easy target for being bullied. And... I, I had daily bullying from a physical and a mental perspective right the way through until I was 18 and it affected me so much that I felt like I had to be somebody I wasn't. Um, I had no confidence, I had no self-esteem, I literally did everything I possibly could to make people like me, I wanted people um, to accept me but I was I was very much a sheep mm. so to very easily influenced and at 18 I, I was in quite a dark place and as I said before I, I tried to take my own life when I was 18 and it wasn't a cry for help I just genuinely didn't want to be here and I failed in my eyes I failed at being able to do that so it kind of pushed me further down into a, a depressive state and into an even darker place and I kind of thought well you know, if I'm not able to live the life that I want to lead, then I might as well just do what everybody else wants me to do. So I went to university because somebody told me I should. I did the degree that I did because somebody told me I should. And I basically, I ended up in a corporate job because somebody said that that might be the great path for me. I never made a decision from myself because I didn't have the confidence or belief in myself to do that. So... When I suffered from this TIA when I was 29, you know, I kind of woke up, and that's the best way I can describe it. I woke up out of this haze, and I suddenly had this realization that I had wasted 29 years of my life, and actually what I was doing wasn't something that made me happy to my core. Why couldn't I be happy to my core? Why couldn't I wake up every morning and want to do the thing that I wanted to do? Why did I have to wake up every morning and pretend to be somebody I wasn't and do something that other people wanted me to do? So it was tough. And unlike the Hollywood movies where you have your eureka moments and then you have the lovely montage of all the great things of how it all works and comes to plan, the hard work really began. And it was during that time that I actually found running. And what running did for me was it gave me an ability to challenge myself in ways that I never thought I would be able to, to do. So, you know, to run my first 5K, I'd never run 5K in my life before. You know, it's, it, it, it felt like a marathon mm. to me. That's what it was perceived to be. I thought, how the hell can I do that? But I did it. Mm. When I did it, I kind of thought, well, I can do that. Why can't, you know, let's see what else I can do. And with each little step, you know, my 10K, my half marathon, running my first marathon, you know, I became addicted to the fact that I had control now over the life that I wanted to lead. And that gave me confidence. That gave me self-esteem. So when I say running saved my life, Running gave me the ability to express myself. It gave me the ability to be me. And it. And I'm very lucky, I suppose, to be able to sit here and say that I found something that I truly love in life. Mm. Now making a career out of it, which, you know, I'm proud and I'm happy that I've managed, I've managed to find that. That's awesome. Um, so I suppose that leads me to a question that a lot of people would give a very simple answer to. So people that are, going about their life and they don't necessarily enjoy their job and 
they kind of feel like they're in your position, that they're doing stuff that other people think is a good idea for them. And I might say to them, well, just make your own decisions, do what you want to do. And it's not it's not always as easy for, as that because that is wrapped up in a lack of self-confidence, lack of self-worth, lack of self-belief. And also you're already six foot deep, like you've already got the job, the house or whatever. It's not as easy to just change and make another decision. So when you kind of talk to people, you maybe hear people with a similar story to you. I suppose I'm asking, what is your advice to that person? Where do they start out to make and facilitate the changes that you made that deep down they know they need to make? Well, I think I think you're right in what you say. Ultimately, it's very easy for somebody that's kind of gone through it to be able to turn around and go, yeah, just make the change. You know, look at what you can have. It's incredible. Mm. People don't see is the literal the, the heartache and you know the hard times and the depressive states that you go through when you're making that change and they do exist you know you kind of end up with with nothing and then you have to build yourself back up again um, I suppose from from my perspective and maybe the best way I can kind of explain this is is that I, I hid the fact that, that I was gay for 30 years of my entire life and that was what I, I was bullied at school for it. I was told that I was weak. I was told that I was um, subhuman, and and this made this it, this had a complete effect over my life until I had my TIA. When I had my TIA, I was actually married. I was married to a woman, mm-hmm. you know. So I had the house. I had the wife. I had the car. I had the mortgage. I had the pension. I had, you know, the job. I was golden. I had the golden handcuffs, so to speak. But what I didn't have was my happiness. And I suppose the best way I can explain to it is is that we're on this world for such a finite amount of time. You know, I didn't want to be one of those people that on my deathbed thought, I wish I'd have done this differently. You know, the people in my life didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve that. So... I was lucky enough to find something that, that made me happy to my core. Mm-hmm. to my core and once you find that kind of inner peace that inner acceptance of of who you are and what you're about everything else is kind of quite easy mm-hmm. it all falls into place and that's what's happened with the 401 challenge you know everything that we did was for the right reasons everything we did was was because that's the way we wanted it to, to do it it was on our terms and and subsequently i think the connection that we had with people and what we created is something that we'll be proud of until until I do, and, and you know, take my deathbed, which hopefully will be many years from now. <laughs> so, looking at the 401 challenge and post 401 challenge, I was chatting to you before we went on air about uh, a small BBC story that looked at you kind of post run because the run happened, you got loads of good PR, everyone was talking about it. And I suppose maybe not really enough coverage was spent around the kind of whys and the rationales and actually the effect of the challenge. And this story on the BBC talked to you about, well, Ben, talk us through your mental well-being now that you've done the challenge. And you were talking about, well, actually, I'm kind of struggling a bit, if I'm honest. Like, I'm, I'm, I've had this massive high. And I, I think I can relate to it in that, um, I always watched uh, actors that were famous when I was younger because that was my career before I went into fitness. I was an actor and I always saw these massive downward spirals of actors because there's not really anything more of a bigger high, probably similar to an Olympian, where you put out a film, everyone loves it, you make millions of pounds and then you go back to your house, close the door and it's just you after this massive high. Um, so I suppose kind of talk to me through you you finished the challenge four months ago. What's the last four months been like for you after the high of the challenge and you discovering or kind of be- becoming more comfortable with where you're at mentally? Um, it's been a roller coaster, and I'm not going to lie. Um, I think kind of going back and touching on a few points that you said there. Um, you know, I want to make it perfectly clear to people that the the reason why we did this challenge wasn't. To, to be in the limelight. We knew that we needed to be in order to raise the quarter of a million pounds. And, and in a way, that kind of came off the back of what it was that we did. And yes, it was great. And, and we still are in the limelight now. You know, we still have a, a high profile and, 
and and people still know about what it was that we did but it, it's more the physiological changes in my body that that people don't really understand um because nobody's ever done this before you know nothing's been written um, it's not like you're going to train for a marathon and you know for a fact that if you give it everything you've got you're probably not going to be able to walk for the two days after a marathon mm -hmm. there is nothing documented to tell me exactly how I should be feeling right now or should be acting or what's going on inside my body um, so I've kind of in a way I because I've done something that nobody else has done before I, I feel quite alone in that sense mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we've pioneered in a way to achieving something and and because nobody else can really, really, really understand what it is that I've gone through and what I'm going through now, it does feel lonely. Um, there's the mental side of things which are very much affected by the physical aspects. So naturally, um, my heart will have grown during this, uh, uh, during this endeavor. Um, it's a muscle like anything else. Uh, I have a, a scan... Um, a heart echo which I'm going to be going to tomorrow um, to, to find out exactly how big my heart has actually grown. Naturally with that, that means that blood is pumping around my body more, my metabolism is, is supersonic ultimately. Uh, I have the ability to not produce lactic acid or, or produce lactic acid and break it down very quickly so I don't get stiff anymore. Um, I have, was addicted to adrenaline um, throughout this entire process. So to suddenly stop in that respect, your body, your body goes into a little bit of shock. Um, this is the best way I can describe it. So hormonally, I'm all over the place. So there would be days where you know I'd be sat on the sofa. Um, over the past couple of months and I'd be crying on the sofa uh, and then the later on that afternoon I'd be absolutely elated you know it, almost quite psychotic mm -hmm. um, and it's nothing that I'm ashamed of at all it's just this is just the way it is um, I, I don't know the full extent to which this has physiologically changed my body you know I'm currently going through tests on that to find out what that is and then obviously the doctors will recommend a course of treatment or a course of action to kind of help me level out again to where where I was before but but naturally that does affect you mentally you know I, I think the feeling of being depressed I, I felt that over the past kind of three to four months um, the feeling that I had a four-year goal and that's come to an end now and okay so what's my purpose now um, it's not the idea of, oh my God, I'm not going to be in the limelight, I'm not going to be famous anymore. To be perfectly honest with you, I couldn't care less about that. Mm -hmm. That's not why I did what I did. It's more about the fact of, right, okay, so I've still got many years of my life to go, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I've done this, do I go back into a full-time job? Is that what's right for me? Or do I look to develop something that, that I want to develop? Do I do, you know, can I go back to a form of normal life after I've run 10,500 miles around the UK and, you know, been inspired by all these people that came out and ran with me? It's, my, my sense of normality is very different now. And I suppose I'm just still trying to find that. Mm -hmm. So over the last four months, you know, there's been moments where it's been a bit dark, you haven't mm. felt great. What, what have you focused on to remain positive is it a fact that you've still been running like well I love running so let's go out for a run or like what's been your stability yeah well um, I'll let you into a little bit of a secret um, I kind of lost my love for running for a little bit um, I'm, I suppose maybe you know the guys listening will probably think well that's kind of obvious but it was something that I wasn't prepared for you know and this is something that I love to do and I I planned to do a cool down process afterwards, which consisted of a month's worth of back to back halves, followed by a month's worth of back to back 10Ks, followed by a month's worth of back to back 5Ks. And for me, that was logical. But yet, you know, as I said, nobody's done this before. So nobody could tell me what my cool down process was going to be. And so I thought, right, okay, day 402, I'll wake up. This will be the plan. I'll go out and I'll run half a marathon. And, you know, I'll, I'll start to just feed it down and feed it down. 
I went out on day 402 and I think I got seven miles in and I just kind of went, I can't be bothered with this. Mm. I can't, you know, it was like, I just, I, I'm tired. I need to stop. I need to rest and recuperate. But, you know, there was that feeling and that fear that the physiological changes in my body needed me to cool down. You know, but then the mental side of me was telling me, well, actually, no, I can't really be bothered to cool down. So I, I went out the following day and I think I did 11 miles and then I made the decision that actually, you know, I was going to switch it up and I was going to kind of change it up to um, a bit of cross training. So working with my personal trainer that I worked with before uh, the project um, and going out and doing the occasional run. That. I wasn't burning the same amount of calories that I was burning on a daily basis. You know, during the challenge, I was burning six and a half thousand. So, you know, I wasn't burning that amount of calories, therefore not burning that amount of energy. And I found that actually I, there was a two month period where I just didn't sleep. And that was something I wasn't prepared for. And we all know what happens to you when you don't sleep. Mm -hmm. that, that basic need to be able to switch off and recuperate and re-energize and, you know, grow your muscles and and kind of be awake for the following day i was finding that you know i couldn't get to sleep until half past five in the morning most nights wow. and i was having to rely upon a sleeping tablet in order to do that which then affects you mentally mm -hmm. in a negative way so throughout all of this you know we were being honored with awards and we were being honored with you know amazing kind of messages through from people and they were amazing, absolutely amazing, but it was it was kind of tarnished by this whole kind of experience that I was going through and the fact that I didn't know what was happening to me and I didn't I felt alone and I felt, you know, quite emotional. And I suppose the one great thing that kind of came out of all of this was what was gonna happen next. And I kind of thought, well, we've created a legacy out of this challenge. So why not let's see what we can do with that and and that's where the idea around the 401 foundation came about which is what i'm focusing on now which is my new purpose going forward mm -hmm. um and, and yeah we're excited about it uh but that, that's that's the type of thing that i suppose i focused on during the dark times but you know don't get me wrong there were times where i just didn't want to get up off the sofa you know my other half you know he's he's been incredibly supportive by the way through this entire challenge and you know, bless him, he's, he's had to put up with, you know, a bit of a bipolar person since this project's finished. Mm -hmm. And he's stuck around and he's been incredibly supportive, which I'm grateful for. Um, you know, things are changing. Uh, the doctors have prescribed me some medication, which I'm taking at the moment. And that's kind of leveling me out quite a lot, which is great. Um, but it's ironic. You know, I did this project to raise awareness around the effects of bullying and mental health. And, you know, here I am sat here now with suffering from a mental health problem. And again, as I said, I'm not ashamed about that. It's just this is what has happened because of what it is that I've done. Mm. Well, you've put yourself or you spent a period of time in a vastly different physiological state, as you said. Like you, you do a marathon every day, the, the energy debt that creates, the, just the level of tiredness how that changes your um, you know, blood levels of adrenaline, cortisol, everything. To have that no longer there, yeah, I can imagine. Incredible, incredible physiological changes. Yeah. So talking about the actual challenge, I think um, knowing that I am a nutritionist, we have to kind of think, well, how on earth? I mean, I would personally probably be in Pizza Hut every night if I knew that I had to eat about 10,000 calories every day. What, what what were you eating? Was it just a seafood diet? Was there any kind of thought or science there? What what happened with the new nutritional recover, recovery kind of aspect? Um, I, I feel very guilty with what I'm about to say. No, um, don't. I, I, I think, again, because nobody had ever done this before, no, nobody could really advise me, so to speak, as to, as to what to kind of consume. Um, I, I followed, for the first 50 days, I followed the kind of typical marathon runners regime which was you know porridge in the morning um don't really eat anything while you run and then just try and cram in as much food as you can on the night uh whatever that is and you know the whole kind of carb loading it was quite high in carbohydrates and and i actually lost 17 kilos within the first 50 days and my body fat dropped to just over seven percent 
and my energy levels were so low and my mindset which was played such a huge part in me achieving this project my mindset was quite negative yeah. you know felt like giving up you know I was I was I had injuries and I just thought I can't do this like this anymore so I kind of sat and I, I in a way went back to the basics I just went well what do I like uh, I like coffee Okay, fair enough. Well, let's incorporate that into the day. I like a pint of cider. Let's incorporate that into the day. Um, you know, I, I like to have a variety of foods that I eat. Mm-hmm. Um, and because we hadn't we hadn't been able to secure a nutritionist to come on board and support us with this project, um, no, nobody really kind of had a – whether or not it wasn't an interest in the project or whether or not they saw it as too big of a risk or too much of an investment in their time, I'm not too sure, but – it got to the point where I had complete control over what I wanted to eat. So I did. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would be found sometimes in a Toby Carvery halfway through a marathon eating a roast dinner because that's what my body wanted mm-hmm. me to eat. Um, I ate fish and chips. I ate, um, you know, sometimes I had steak and chips for lunch. I, I, I washed that down with a pint of cider every now and again. I did things that motivated me. Yep. And... I actually found that my weight stabilized. I put weight on and it actually stabilized and my energy levels were so high. So I do believe to this day that if, and this is only me personally, that if I had have had a nutritionist on board, I think maybe what would have happened was that I would have felt the pressure to eat in a particular way. Mm. And I don't think, therefore, I would have achieved what I would have achieved because... I would have probably ended up hating the nutritionist, mm-hmm. so to speak. Yeah, no, uh, I, I can I, I can imagine, and I think the problem is, is when a nutritionist would look at your situation, they think, oh, we need to get this really right. Like this is an extreme challenge, but the reality is, the biggest need you physically have on your challenge is just sheer caloric volume. You're going through that much that you need to take on board that much. So, you know. A nutritionist can't sit there and go, right, I want you to have steak with, you know, potatoes. and You just wouldn't get the calories in. You yeah. need to be eating fish and chips and a bit of pizza and all that kind of stuff. Now, as a nutritionist, I would probably say, okay, let's try and, you know, couple that with some really high antioxidant fruits, things that are going to help a bit of muscular damage. But ultimately, I'm going to be pretty pro fish and chips as a nutritionist myself, because I'm looking at your primary objectives. I think it's interesting what you say, because actually one thing that I actually found throughout this project was that I became so attuned with what my body wanted. Because I I had a team of people, a team of five people, that that really took away a lot of the the daily stress from me. They didn't travel with me. My my other half came and traveled with me every now and again. But, you know, it was my other half, my dad, project manager Tolu, my PR lady uh, Lucy, and uh, my mum, you know, these you know, five close people to me dealt with the logistics of every day, uh, the dealing with the therapists, um, the accommodation side of things, the running clubs that we, we kind of work with to plan the routes. So I only had to concentrate on actually running. Mm-hmm. I broke myself everywhere naturally, but I didn't have to deal with the kind of organization around things. It was all downloaded into my phone. So just dealing with the running and dealing with myself meant that I kind of became very attuned to what my body wanted and when it wanted it. Mm. So I'd wake up in the morning and my body would crave porridge some mornings or it would crave a fry up some mornings. And so I would give it what it wanted. You know, there was a, a weird experience of where I ended up eating a bowl of broccoli. Mm. You know, body just wanted a bowl of broccoli. Mm. That's what I fancied. So I ate that. And I think in a way that affected my mindset in a positive way because I was giving my body what it wanted. But it's funny how you say about kind of twinning it with certain things like antioxidant fruits. My body was craving that type of thing anyway. Mm. So I think the interesting thing is is that we, we hear about the fact that these are the great things to eat. When you really start to listen to your body, your body will tell you to eat this type of things anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's fascinating and I'm a massive fan of trying to get people to listen but the problem is is you have got to spend quite a lot of time listening and not a lot of people will go on that journey to really listen to the body. Um, I'm really in tune with my body. I cooked a chicken soup last night, looks amazing, 
in theory, I should be eating it today because I've just prepared it, you know, it's there, but I just don't want it. Like, I went downstairs, my body doesn't want that, and I've eaten different things today, but it's because I'm very well attuned to my body, but I listen to it in the right ways, because obviously that can that can be negative for us, and people might just be like, oh, well, I just want pizza, or I just want that, and they're actually, they're getting stimuluses from their environment rather than their actual kind of belly and mind. Yeah, I was about to say that's exactly it. There's listening to your body. Are you tr- listening to the true voice of what your body wants? And then there's listening to the, I suppose, the uh, environmental influence of what your body wants. Mm-hmm. You know, where we, there's so many people out there that work such hectic lifestyles. You know, I, I was there. You know, you, you come to lunchtime and it's like, right, I've got 20 minutes because I've got to get this report off to my boss because he needs it, he's breathing down my neck, I'm gonna go down the canteen at work and I'm just gonna grab something quick. And that could be a a sandwich, you know, or it could be a packet of crisps or a chocolate bar, just to kind of give you that sense of energy. And I always thought, well, this is what my body's wanting, you know, this is what it's telling me it wants, something quick, something energy efficient, etc. Having also the ability to plan and prepare, uh, you know, things the night before, People don't necessarily have the time to do that, mm-hmm. but I think the key, the key to me is it's about distinguishing between what is an environmental influence, i.e. what your body's asking because it's in a state of um, fight, so to speak, or are you actually truly hearing what your body wants? And I was lucky enough to be in a situation where you know running 401 days and only having to concentrate on my body and actually running you do hear the true voice. Mm. So I listened to it. Mm. Um, so when you were on the challenge, did, did you sleep well? Was uh, That obviously wasn't a problem, probably slept like a log. Uh, do you know what, funnily enough, a lot of people say that it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been a problem. Um, you know, there were some nights where I didn't sleep at all. Uh, again, the physiological changes in my body, I was finding towards the very end of the challenge, probably the last three months, that even running, you know, getting up at half past six in the morning, going doing a school visit in the morning, driving myself to the marathon, running with a hundred, sometimes a hundred people, and having to answer the same conversations all some sorry the same questions all the time, which was amazing, um, but you know mentally exhausting. Mm. Then going to my therapist who wanted to know everything about what it was that I'd done. And then going to somebody's house where I slept overnight, and what do they want? They want to know everything about what I've done as well. So constantly on the go until 11 o'clock at night and having to fit social media and press interviews and picking up with the team as well during the day, you know, you'd think I'd be exhausted. Mm. It's getting to the point where I'd be getting to 11 o'clock at night and I'd be sat there twiddling my thumbs going, okay, what next? Mm. And I'd sit up until 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning doing work and I'd then be getting up at half past six again. So I'd be surviving on a couple of hours sleep a night. Wow. And obviously then to obviously finish the challenge, you know, the fact that I didn't sleep for almost two months after the challenge is no shock to me because I was, you know, even doing the level of exercise and the level of activity both mentally and physically during the challenge. You know, if I couldn't sleep then, how was I going to sleep afterwards? Mm. Well, a lot... Of, I Well... Do you think it could have, you know, reflecting back on the routine, do you think it could have been different if you had almost had a bit of an evening routine where you said, right, it's 10.30 now, all phones go off, laptops go off, I'm now going to have like a bit of, well, I'm just going to read a book or I'm going to stretch or I'm going to meditate or I'm, you know, this, I now need to prep my mind for sleep because you had 16, 17, 18 hours where your brain was being on nonstop And then um, I suppose I'm asking the question, did you say to your brain, actually now it's time to rest, so let's prep my mind for rest? Yeah, I I think the honest answer to that is I wish I could have done, but I think there's what you want or what on paper seems like a great thing to do and the actual reality of something. You know, sometimes I wouldn't be arriving at people's house until 10 o'clock at night. If I was then to have half an hour in their house, having not done my social media, which needed to be done every single day, to then have half an hour where I might eat in their house and they might ask questions. If I was turning around and going, I'm just going up to the room to meditate and go to bed. You know, it's kind of... Yeah, I get you. It's kind of a nice thing to do, but the reality 
was that we would just not have been able to fit that in. Um, I, I think we were very reactive. We were very... Is reactive the right word? I don't know. And um, we were very adaptive, I suppose is the right word, to situations. Um, we knew what we wanted to achieve with these four objectives and everything that we did resonated within those four. So any ideas that we came up with that weren't part of those four objectives were dismissed, even if they were great or not. So everything that we did was very smart. It was very organized. It was very kind of, um, there was a meaning to it. So it wasn't like we could just let something go or, you know, do something a little bit differently so we could incorporate something else. I, I do feel like we were in fight mode for quite a lot of that, that challenge. And again, maybe that was the reason why I was successful. Mm. You know, the fact that I didn't give myself turn off time um, throughout it, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes it's best to just go all in and you know, just be a bit obsessive about it. Because otherwise, if you have too much time to potentially contemplate, you might be sitting there thinking, uh, maybe I shouldn't go out running today. Perhaps I'll just chill. And <laughs> you weren't in a position to do that. You're all in. <laughs> no, there, there was a there was a there was a period throughout the challenge which um you know I had did have to take ten days off and you know I'd hurt my back quite badly and it meant that I had to take ten days off in order to sort my back out um, but started back back out on the road in Inverness which was ten days later and I had a deficit of two hundred and sixty two miles to make up because that's what I missed mm. you know wanted to still finish on the same day still achieve the same distance so. You know, if anything, everything ramped up after that 10 days off because I was running 30 to 35 miles a day at some times, which then meant I had less time to do my social media. I had less time to recover. I had less time to get between certain locations. It was just we were in fight mode. And if I had taken a bit of a step back and maybe reflected on stuff, I probably would have gone, what the hell are you doing, Ben? (laughs) Ben, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Um, I love how easy the conversation has flown with you and kind of just your humbleness around what you've achieved. I think it's really nice. Um, I have one last question, though, and I brought it up at the beginning of this podcast in that uh, I thought this was quite a cool little fact in that you went through 23 pairs of trainers on your run. Do you have a favourite pair? Did you have, like... You know Tom Hanks in Castaway, he had his Wilson. Do you have, like, the pair? Did you name them? Was there a connection there? No, I, 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 I'm going to be really boring about this. But, again, you know, there's this whole science between having the right pair of shoes for you and what fits your foot and the way you plant your foot. If anything, I was quite relaxed about that whole thing. And people were donating pairs of trainers to me all over the place. So I didn't wear the same pair of trainer all the time. Mm-hmm. I chopped and changed them. You know, I didn't. I wore a pair until they literally were falling to bits, and then I put a new pair on, which is leery enough a no go when you're doing marathon running. You know, but I was. It didn't have a massive impact on my feet. You know, I had no missing toenails, and I got no blisters right the way through the project. I think having that favorite pair. I don't think I did. (laughs) That's fair enough. Honestly, like some people were saying to me, well, why didn't you keep your trainers? Why didn't you wash them off? And funnily enough, I literally just pull into a service station. I chuck my trainers into the the bin in the service station. And then I put a new pair on the the, the following day. So there's probably all these kind of like half-worn pairs of trainers that are dotted around the UK. (laughs) I won college. Uh, Ben, I'd love for people to be able to uh, come and say hello to you, check out some of the the kind of PR and the the kind of content you've put out. What is the best links, social profiles to send people to? Well, the best way to kind of get in touch with us is through our website at the401challenge.co.uk. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at the401challenge come and check out our posts uh you know all our history of the challenge is on the 401 facebook page and i will be giving talks up and down the country uh, but you can get all those details on our website awesome ben amazing um for people that are listening i hope you've enjoyed a different angle for the show today someone that has uh 
you know, done an incredibly physically tiring, mentally tiring feat and has been able to share some insights that you wouldn't usually kind of consider. I like that. Um, if you've enjoyed the show, once you see it go up online, you know, hit retweet, you know, reply to uh, Ben and Ben, which it will end up being, it will be Ben and Ben. Um, reply to us, say something, engage with Ben, ask a question. Uh, Ben's a very humble guy. He will get back to you. He will help you, um, especially because we've talked about some kind of mental well-being stuff today. There's probably going to be a couple of people that you know would, would like to reach out to Ben and explore a couple of things, and I think that's awesome. Um, but Ben, whatever challenge you pursue in the future, good luck. If I can help, I will. Reach out to me. I'm here. Uh, but thank you for sharing your time today. Thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate it. And to everyone listening, stay awesome uh, and maybe consider your next challenge. Maybe not 401 marathons, but maybe something that just challenges your energy, challenges you mentally and physically. That's why I play rugby. That's why I get in the gym. That's why I do certain things because I just think it gives us something to drive us. Anyway, stay awesome. Hey, everyone. Vancouver Radio, episode 241, I think. But as you know on the show, it doesn't...